this is a surreal day for me because we are revisiting a book that I wrote 10 years ago. And at that time in my life, I was radically transformed by following someone else's obedience story, mm-hmm. Katie Davis, now Majors. And it's really surreal to be revisiting this time in my life that I wrote this book and all that's come out of it. But specifically, and I'm just shaky about it now because Katie has become such a dear friend. Mm-hmm. And now knowing her, I mean, I didn't know her for so long when she changed my life. And now knowing her and and watching her live and even this book that she's just written that is kind of <laughs> then what it's like and then what after you've given your whole life to god then mm-hmm. what um we're both living the then what um in our surrender journeys and i have just chill bumps thinking about it because and really teary because um she's a sister in the faith and i i use the analogy in the book anything that dominoes fall into each other and katie fell into mine and without katie surrendering I don't think I would have surrendered in the same way and opened my heart and life to God in the same way. And so she fell into my life and I've fallen into some of yours. And it's just really a full circle moment to all be here together on the podcast. So Katie, it is such an honor to have you here. And I think everybody can tell it's more than an honor. I'm truly kind of in a surreal moment here. And again, we're friends, y'all. Like we've hung out many times and talked about everything. And so now it's not like fangirl Jenny here with Katie, but <laughs> <laughs> whatever, it hasn't been in the past. Um, but so much of your life, Katie has changed from that blog that I read so many years ago. So why don't we start in case people don't know the beginning of your story with just your journey back in your twenties and where God called you to surrender. Sure. Whew. You're getting me teary before we even got started yet, <laughs> but I'm, I'm with you. It does feel really amazing and surreal and, um, man, just to look back on the last 10, 15 years when this kind of all fell in motion. And I think for me, um, for those who kind of don't know my story at first, you know, early in my life, surrender looked really big. And I surrendered a lot of kind of life dreams and hopes and um, a really kind of secure, affluent American life situation to go and serve overseas in Uganda and um, fell in love with that place and more importantly with the people in that place and felt God continually asking me to lay down my dreams for my life in order to love the people he was putting in front of me there and um, myself and then later my children and then later my husband we built our lives there and I, I think that surrender kind of in the eyes of the world looked really big um, and really like kind of this grand gesture. And and in a lot of ways it was hard, but in a lot of ways it was easier because it was such a big thing. And it was such like this grand adventure, really. You know, I was, <laughs> I was young, I was 18, 19, 20, kind of as this journey started. And I think maybe surrenders a little bit easier at, at that point. We're a little bit like less attached and we know a little bit less of what our life really is going to look like. And um, it did feel, it felt big and scary, but it also felt really exciting. And in the last 10 years, I feel like God has called me to just a much quieter surrender. And I think you probably know this really well too, with just the way that your writing career has kind of exploded and taken off. And um but there are these like really quiet moments of surrender that nobody else <laughs> gets to see, even yeah. in all the writing and the stages right. and the podcasting and the what yeah. have you. And um, <laughs> just that I feel like Hold surrender. On. She says that because she knows some of them. <laughs> 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 just so y'all know, she's not saying that like, oh yeah, everybody has that. It's like, no, she's she knows some of them. <laughs> Yeah. And I think it's important. I mean, we can't always share a lot of the things. And I say this on Instagram all the time. A lot of the things that are hardest about our lives, we can't necessarily put in public because they aren't ours to share. And so, yeah, I just think it's important for people to really feel that, but yes, keep going. (laughs) Yeah. And so, you know, just in thinking back over the years of surrender, there are those like huge moments of surrender, right? We've both had them where we're like, okay, God, take everything. I'll do whatever you want. But having that be true in the big things, 
yeah. almost feels a little bit easier than having that be true yeah, in the true. small every day when somebody that you yes. love so deeply is struggling so deeply. The surrender of saying like, okay, God, I don't see it. I know you're good. This doesn't look good. Those things don't go together in my head, but I'm going to trust you anyway. The mm. surrender of, um, you know, parenting children. You and I both have kids who once were just little yeah. and looked to yeah. us for everything who have now launched and are going yeah. out and doing their big adult things and making their own decisions and being able, there's a little bit of a false, like when you're little, I can keep you really safe. And of course, ultimately, like I can't, God knows only, but that becomes like a lot more real yeah. to a mom as her kids are like actually not under her roof. And so to for me, the last many years have looked like surrendering my children and going mm. like, okay, God, I believe you love them more than me. I believe you know them better than me. I believe that you see the path they're on when I can't see it. And I'm going to trust you with their lives. And that's, that's hard. And that's a really like internal quiet surrender that not everybody gets to see, but it's just as important, if not more important. What people may not know that have followed you in the past or follow you now is that you were called to give up the thing you were called like reverse, give up <laughs> things. So talk a little bit about just that journey now and how surprising that probably felt to you in your heart. You were going to live there forever. Oh, and ever. I mean, forever. Adopted. And ever. So if you don't know, like there, I mean, to talk a little bit about your adoption story too. Sure. So I um, began fostering when I was very young, um, three and then five and then six and then eventually 13 uh, girls, all sibling sets and began the process of fostering them and then began the process to legally adopt them. And so they are still legally adopted by myself and my husband today. And then we went on to have two more biological kids. So that brings our grand total to 15. And we built our lives deeply in Uganda and had yeah. um, precious community and built our ministries there at a ministry, Amazima, that I founded as just this tiny thing out of my living room of my tiny house. You know, now we have over 300 staff and about to be, you know, we're mm. about to cross the mark of a thousand kids going to two different schools that we have. And so, I mean, my husband pastored our church there. The church met in our yard. Talk about like wow. deeply invested. Yeah. We were rooted there in a way that I loved. Like there was, mm -hmm. there was hard, but I loved yeah. our life there. I loved our people there. I still love our people there. And, um, it's been about a year and a half now since God made it really, really abundantly clear that we were to be here in the United States mm. um, for a season. And we don't know how long the season is. And talk about scary surrender because I like yeah. really like to know the plan, <laughs> which is so funny, right? I talk about this a little bit in my new book, Safe All Along, but just that that's false. Like yeah. I can think that I know the plan and that gives me kind of this false peace. But in reality, right. we all know that we never really know the plan, but we were definitely pretty blindsided. We thought we were going to be here for a short amount of time. We've been here now for a year and a half. We think we'll be here for at least quite a bit longer. Um, and God has made it clear that this is where he has us in this season. And he's given us really good gifts and provided for us really well here. Um, but I have, I have kicked and screamed against that. Um, yeah. because I surrendered everything here to move toward what he had called me to there. And so then to surrender that, to move forward to the next thing he might be calling us to, I, I think I felt like that was a little unfair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like you built a life, you loved yes, it, and you loved yes. your life. I mean, I, I think everybody listening is thinking, oh, you got to come back. Yes, like that, that, <laughs> right. that would have been their dream, right? But I'm just going to tell you, because we were together almost a year ago now, Katie, and I mean, it was it was the four of us, like, and, and there were a lot of tears. And I mean, it was, so and it was tears. just that I was watching in your eyes that pain of just leaving a life that you loved and starting over. And 
And so just so y'all don't get confused that coming back to the U.S. was not the dream <laughs> and like secretly she was waiting for God to release her. This was such a loss for you and and the community you had there and the people that you've done your whole life with, right? And your whole kid's life with. So, so let's talk about the book because it is, I mean, first of all, I want to read the subtitle. Safe all along, trading our fears and anxieties for God's unshakable peace. Katie, I'm going to be honest. There's a part of me even though I know you well, and I have seen you cry, that can't believe you get afraid. I mean, you know what I mean? Like you just, I mean, you just kind of are um, ballsy <laughs> and not just in what you do, like kind of who you are. Like you're kind of yeah. just, there, she, y'all, she's not, she's not, unshakable is in the title. She's not very shakable. She feels mm. like you could literally have to go through anything and you'd be okay. So talk a little bit about those fears and anxieties and where this book came from for you. Sure. Um, well, thanks. Yeah. And I, I think I would have said that was true of me until, I don't know, three or four years ago. Wow. Um, we kind of had hold a on. series. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Everybody listening is going, wow. I've never heard someone that would say that was pretty true of me. <laughs> like, like she, you really weren't a, fr- I have to go back to that. Let's start with that. Why? Like, why were you like that? That is That is powerful in itself. I don't know. I mean, I think it has to just be like a supernatural gift from the Lord that allowed me to do things that like other people wouldn't do. I don't think that you weren't like sitting there doing them and you were like totally terrified. Like you were just like, nope, I'm just doing it. It's, it was that simple for you kind of, I think people are very curious. Yeah. I mean, I think so. I think God just kind of, I didn't really have that spirit of fear. And then I think. (laughs) <laughs> living through and That's kind amazing. of powering through some really, really challenging yeah. things. Um, back to back to back to back. Like I felt like our life was kind of in chaos and then there was COVID and like the whole world was in chaos. Um, and a lot of our neighbors in Uganda and our friends and people we were doing life with were deeply impacted, like couldn't get to work, couldn't get food. And so, um, that, I mean, just, there were a lot of things and my anxiety, I mean, I, I had never, I would have never said like, oh, I feel anxious. And then suddenly like anxious was all that I felt all the time. Um, and, and just going like, okay, God, what, what do I even, what do I even do with this? And like, okay, in my head, I know that you or God who says, cast all your anxieties on me. I know that you are God who sent Jesus, who said, I am your peace and peace. I leave you and let not your hearts be troubled, but like my heart is troubled and I don't think I can do anything about it. Like I can't untangle it. I can't get it untroubled. And so, um, you know, what does it look like to move that from this head knowledge of like, I know Mm -hmm. that this is what the Bible says. And I believe what the Bible says to be true, but like, that is not what I feel in a way that's like deeply impacting my life, my decision-making. I mean, I became this like, yeah, I went from this girl who was like not afraid and could make any decision to like, I don't know what we should have for dinner tonight. And I would agonize over like, should I make this soup or this soup? And just kind of was like, I don't even know. I don't know Mm -hmm. who I am right now. And so honestly, and still like, I wouldn't say, we moved unexpectedly to the United States when I was already like halfway done writing this book. Right. Mm-hmm. So kind of that thing of like, you know, they, there are people who say like, I'll never write a marriage book. Cause I just like, don't want the enemy to go after my marriage. It <laughs> felt like that a little of like, Oh yeah. Oh, you don't write about surrender write y'all. about <laughs> peace. Right. And so right. like now you're not having any. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, we moved in the middle and again, like you sat with yeah. me in those tears. I mean, like gut wrenching. Yeah. Of just wondering like, how are we going to do this? How are we going to rebuild? And I think though, I mean, of course God has been so faithful to meet me there. And I think we so often think that like, you know, we were talking about this at Bible study last night. Like we, we so often think that like happiness is the end goal or a changed Mm. circumstance is the end goal. Like we say Mm -hmm. like, okay, God, I surrender and I trust you, but there's that like false theology back there that says, and like now, because I surrendered and trusted you, Mm. things, things are going to shift and it's going to be 
better. And it is going to be better on like a heart level. Mm. But circumstantially, I mean, we, we know that's not true. Look in the Bible, right? We got David. He's like in a cave for years. And then right. he's pretending. I, we were reading a Psalm last night and it said right at the top, when David pretended to be insane. And it was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, like this, the, circ- right. the changed circumstance isn't the prize. Jesus is the prize. More of Jesus now and like more yeah. of him in eternity. And I just think we surrender because we want more of him. And like, mm. he is faithful to give that even when the outward circumstance like gets worse. That's what I felt like. I felt like, okay, God, things aren't getting better. They're actually like getting worse. And now I'm stuck in America and it's winter. And like, I haven't even done winter in like 15 years and I don't know what to do. And why does it get dark <laughs> at 430? Yeah, so, dis- real. so disorienting. But I mean, I, I think we surrender because we want to more deeply experience him. And like, man, I know there are people listening that are going through all sorts of things and their prayer is that their circumstance would change. And like, I get that because I pray. There are a lot of circumstances in my life that aren't pretty that I pray will change. I pray for healing for people that I love deeply. Um, And I pray for safety and protection and wisdom for my kids. You know, I'm going to keep praying those prayers, but at the end of the day, that's, that's not mine to control. Right. And my surrender has invited Jesus into my life in a different way. And like, I would stake my life on promising anybody listening that like more of Jesus is worth it. Even if the circumstance gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah. I think there's such a tie to control and anxiety, right? When we can't control it. And I want to read a quote out of the book. You say, intellectually, I know that I am not in control, nor do I actually want to be in charge of everything experientially, I know deeply that God's plans are so much better than, than mine and that things go better when I stop trying to be in control and instead submit to him. And something even about those words, Katie, like makes me exhale of, Mm. yes, like, yes, he's in control. Talk about just that tie for you and how you've seen letting go of the control of your life and how that's decreased anxiety. Yeah. I mean, I think it's so funny, even as you read that, I'm like, oh yeah, I said that, right? Like I got to actually, like, it's so easy to say that and then just not live it in the day to day because I, there's the the other part of my brain that believes like, well, as long as I can keep everything kind of in control, things will go well for me. Um, But man, the amount of time my, my poor little brain spends like making plans that never happen. Mm. and imagining the worst case scenario and then making the plan for how we're going to deal with the worst case scenario. (laughs) And then we're not even like, those things are not even actually happening to me right now. Like the brain space that is freed up when I can constantly just kind of take those thoughts to Jesus and leave them there with him and go like, okay, I have right now. And like one thing that's been really on my heart recently is just like, what do I want to be said of me Mm. when I die, you know, when this life is over? And I just really don't want it to be like, she was always really busy making sure everything was just right. Mm. Like nobody cares. (laughs) Right. Like I I want people to say like, wow, she loved people really well, or she encouraged Mm. people really well. And like, in order to do those things, I've got to be really, really present Yes. With whatever's happening right now. And I can't do both. I can't be really present with my kids or with my friends or with my people. If, if my mind is living in the future and trying to make a plan for what might happen next. Um, And so I think just, again, like it's, it was always back to surrender, right? Continually surrendering and submitting those thoughts to Christ and just noticing it about myself. Mm -hmm. I think helps me catch it. Right. I notice now when I'm making the plan for two months from now and I'm able to go like, okay, I don't actually know how that's going to play out. And so making four different plans for the four different scenarios that might happen, like it's not fruitful. 
It just Mm -hmm. isn't. And so like retraining my brain to go like, okay, what can you be a really good steward of like today and maybe Mm -hmm. tomorrow? Um, Right. And and yeah, just trying to reframe it into like, I can do something really well now and I can love Jesus really well now and I can love my people really well now. And that might sound really simple, you know? And there's, there's people going like, yeah, well, you have to plan. I mean, yes, I have this gigantic, color-coded calendar yeah. for everybody in my family as a color and we've got right. dentist appointments and we've got this and there's some planning there but we don't have to plan for all these imaginary scenarios I want to talk a little bit and I don't want to make you sad about this but let's talk about why you missed Africa because mm. I think I was so moved by that when we talked last year so talk just about how simple life was there and how much easier it was because I think it's helpful for people to hear how how complicated and cluttered our lives are, what we're up against when it comes to anxiety and living simply. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we just, everything was so much slower and so much simpler. Um, I don't love stereotypes or generalizations, but I do think that generally speaking, the American culture values time above relationship. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, the Ugandan culture values relationship above time. And so in Ugandan culture, it is pretty much just appropriate to be a few minutes late because you spent the extra few minutes having a conversation with somebody Mm. who knocked on your door. And I think I see in American culture that in most circles, it's more appropriate to just say the thing of like, oh my gosh, sorry, I'm running late to a meeting. Bye. And leave. Mm. And nobody's really sad or offended by that because that's how we all live. And so it's not unusual that someone would say that, but I I just, I moved here and I was always late for everything. And therefore I was always in a hurry for everything. And it it felt like there just wasn't time to Mm. like deeply connect with people. And that's one of the things that my heart missed the most was just this slow, deep connection. I mean, I had to learn. It's funny. I had to learn all of that culture going in because I was accidentally really rude. And then I feel like I came back to America and was accidentally really rude because I was doing it all backwards because I taught myself to do it backwards. Um, But, you know, in Uganda, if someone comes to your house, like you have them in, you make them a cup of tea. It's like this whole thing. You have to sit and pay attention and listen. And those are all really good things that we don't have the space for in our day here because there are just always a million meetings to go to and calls to take and kids have all their like individual things. That was a, uh, that was another thing. And part of this is probably because of Uganda. And part of it is probably just, we lived in a really small town and now we live in Nashville and it's big. Um, but just like, you didn't have to drive a lot in Uganda. No. No. And if I had to drive 15 minutes, that was like, an event. So all your kids, I had to like mentally kind of prep for that. Yeah. And so everybody could kind of get to their own places and do their own thing. And a lot of our circles overlapped. So like the people that I worked with were generally also the people that we went to church with. And they were Mm -hmm. also the people that my kids went to school with. And like the teachers at my kids' school were also the parents of my kids' friends were also the co-pastors of our church were also my coworkers. Like we just, there was yep. so much life overlap. And then when we got here, I realized like, oh, I wanted my kids to plug in and have community, but we were like accidentally all making separate communities. Yeah. Like my husband has work people and then I have work people. And then, you know, one of our daughters joined the cheerleading squad. And so she had like cheerleading friends but they all had parents, but none of those parents were like in any of my circles or Benji's circles. And so then everybody had a circle. Well, then we were never like all hanging out together because our people weren't the same. And so anyway, it kind of feels like to be intentional and to live the life that I want to experience for the sake of my family and the connectedness that I want for my family all these years, I thought I was working really hard on intentionality, but really like Ugandan culture was built in a way that it supported my intentionality. Right. And here it feels like I still want to work really hard on all that intentionality and connectedness. But in order to do that, man, it's like, it's It's a lot of upstream. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Cause I did all that research for find your people. 
and it broke my heart. And how, I mean, after the research, I almost was paralyzed of even how to write the book. And you and I talked about this last year. Of, it's just, it's, it's like, oh gosh, we just live in a completely broken system. Like there's, it's really hard, but it's so tied to anxiety too. I think that, that this chaos is just killing us, you know? And so how do we build simpler, smaller lives? And I think, you know, what I'm curious about with you is just how have you made intentional choices mm. there to keep life as simple as possible? I know it's not easy. It takes yeah. a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. And so we're, we're just, we're still learning it and we're still figuring it out. God has been unbelievably kind to us to, um, give us a church and a small group that we love yes. and, and we're all in it together and we're all trying to make the yes. same intentional choices. And so I think that's a big part of it is just finding people who want, want that same thing yeah. and go like, yeah, we're going to swim upstream together. And so yeah. all of us collectively are going to make time for each other. And yeah. we're going to stop by each other's houses unannounced. That was one thing That's that I missed right. the most when we moved was like, I kept saying to everybody I met, like, please come over, please come over, stop by. But like, nobody would do it. Like nobody was coming to my house. <laughs> and in Uganda, we had such a revolving door of people. And so um, I'm thankful for people in my small group who have like taken me seriously and stop by my house. And you talk about this a little bit too, but like, sometimes you have to do it first and it feels yeah. super awkward. Like sometimes I have to go yeah. stop by your right. house Absolutely. and you be like, oh go my first. gosh, I didn't yes. expect you. And me be like, yeah, I know. Isn't it great? Or yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you got to find the people that want it, but it's true. And if we don't do that, it's not going to happen. And I do think so many of you out there right now are taking those little risks and you're messaging me and saying, it's not working. It's not working. Just keep trying. You keep have trying. to find the right people. Like a year ago when I saw Katie, she hadn't found those right people yet. And now she has like, it's, it takes time and work and in it, but it can happen. And so just yes. don't give up. We're looking at an entire society that's lonely and anxious this is the way we fight for it is connection with other people. And so yes. Katie, I, here's what I want everybody to he, do right now, go to Amazon, go to Barnes and Noble, go to wherever you buy your books, safe all along and go get it. And here's why a lot of you say to me when I meet you, it's the sweetest comment. And I, I can't even tell you how much it means to me is thank you for discipling me that through this mm -hmm. podcast, through my works, you feel discipled by me. Well, Katie is one of the people that's discipled me. <laughs> and so I want you to read and know the people that have blessed me and helped me grow up in the faith. And Katie is one of those. Mm -hmm. So y'all, I'm so grateful for this woman and go follow her, go, go get her books. Dare to Hope was the first book. And it talks a lot about the things we've talked about today as well. So anyway, Katie, I love you, friend. It's great to see you. Love Thank you. you too. Thanks, Jenny. 